Hello, hello there and welcome back to War Thunder, to the ship review on the HMS Hawkins, which has been requested actually a little bit, a lot, uh, if I uh, can recall here the comments in the comment section. If you expected here a massive rant, you probably have come to the right place. But with all honesty, this ship is just an insult to everybody that wants to take War Thunder seriously. It is just the perfect example of compression and uh, mismanagement when it comes to the design of the game. Now, before I rant already too much and uh, give away here the joy of listening to me ranting, um, I will run down the statistics and show kind of the obvious lack of uh, performance of the ship in contrast to the higher performance 5.7s, but also the not so great 5.7s, where then it becomes obvious where this ship stands. In a nutshell, this is a World War I cruiser design, having to fight versus some of the best performing uh, cruisers of World War II as well as even some post-World War II cruisers which is ridiculous but before we come to this there is always the very nice and enjoyable five minute guide by Drakini Fell to which YouTube channel you will find the link in the video description down below so without further ado I hope you enjoy. The Hawkins class were transitional cruisers of the Royal Navy classification of these ships at the time was somewhat difficult, although they would later end up in the heavy cruiser category as a result of the various naval treaties. The Royal Navy light cruiser, or more accurately light armoured cruiser design going into World War I, would yield ships of varying armament, with some resembling scaled down versions of the older armoured cruisers, with a couple of six inch guns supplemented by lighter, typically four inch guns, and other later variants that had a unified 6-inch battery. The Hawkins class represented a new line of development. Whilst the light cruiser line would continue past the original 1910 town class and into the C, D and eventually E classes, the Hawkins went a step up with a heavier 7.5-inch main armament. This was, as with many large Royal Navy projects in World War I, as a response to a reported German threat, in this case a supposed new generation of larger cruisers. The basis of the design was the last subclass of the towns, and this meant that the hull was effectively a scaled up light cruiser. Instead of the old mixed main battery, a single calibre was selected, and this gave a main battery of seven single 7.5 inch guns, two forward and three aft in the centre line position, with two final positions amidships either side of the second funnel, or a six gun broadside. As designed, they were to have a secondary battery of short barrel three inch guns for anti-surface work and longer barrel three inch guns for anti-aircraft work, along with six torpedo tubes, two below and four above the waterline. Whilst the torpedoes would be installed, none of the ships as built actually carried this intended secondary battery. Hawkins completed with eight of the longer barreled anti-aircraft 3-inch guns plus a couple of single 40mm cannon, whilst the other ships would drop half of the 3-inch battery in exchange for other weapons. Mostly this consisted of slightly reduced numbers of 4-inch anti-aircraft guns. Refits during the ship's careers would of course further change these armaments. Armour was distributed across a dizzying number of thicknesses, with the best protected part of the belt being 3 inches thick, along with a maximum of 1.5 inches of deck protection. The power plant was initially planned to be a mixed coal and oil fired unit, since coal was more easily available in distant overseas stations. The power plant gave a combined output of 60,000 shaft horsepower for a speed of 30 knots, but three of the five ships would be completed post-war with oil only firing, giving an extra 10,000 shaft horsepower which translated to an extra knot of speed. Coming in at just under 10,000 tons displacement, they fitted neatly into the upper bracket of cruisers allowed under the Washington Naval Treaty, but their limited number of guns on the broadside and the 7.5 inch calibre would soon leave them somewhat vulnerable to other ships which went up to the maximum 8 inch calibre allowed by the treaty and in some cases also managed a greater broadside as well. The Furutakas in Japan for example managed to have the same 6 gun broadside only with 8 inch guns while the upcoming Pensacolas managed 10 gun broadsides. In light of this, they started to become something of an experimental class. They were too far along to cancel, but also too large and powerful to neglect. 
As such, the final ship, HMS Cavendish, was renamed whilst under construction and redesigned, emerging as the carrier HMS Vindictive. Like the second as-built iteration of HMS Furious, she had two separate flight decks, one for takeoff forward and another for landing after the superstructure, along with a reduced main and secondary battery. But after seeing action in the Baltic War, she was largely returned to a cruiser configuration, but retained a forward hangar in place of the second forward 7.5-inch gun. In the mid-1930s, the ships were due for replacement, but with various incidents raising the prospects of war, they were instead retained. Effingham had the main battery replaced with nine single 6-inch guns, adding two guns to the centreline and thus increasing the total broadside to eight barrels. Hawkins and Frobisher could not be rearmed similarly in time, and so instead they had their anti-aircraft batteries increased, with Frobisher losing its wing 7.5-inch guns to this end. A mixture of modern 4-inch, 40mm and 20mm guns were installed. Raleigh wasn't available anymore, having wrecked itself on a rock in 1922, about a year into its service. And Vindictive would be converted into a fleet repair ship, and would spend the war in this role. Effingham would be lost in Norway to an uncharted shoal shortly after the start of the war, and the surviving three ships would be broken up shortly after the end of World War II. So now let's have a look at the ship in port and let's see what is what in War Thunder. Let's begin with the armor and especially the belt armor. We have indeed a very much distributed armor scheme, uh, beginning at its thinnest at the bow with 38 millimeters, then uh, 50.8 millimeters, which also represents the upper belt, and then uh, parts of 63 millimeter and maxing out at 76.2 millimeter or three inch armor of rolled homogeneous armor near the engine compartments and then thinning down to the stern of 57 millimeters that has its advantages and disadvantages so first of all the advantages is that when you fight destroyers they have a harder time to flood you and to penetrate you because um, you have more safe zones especially if you angle and especially if you stay at range but versus cruisers that have high caliber guns and or high penetration values and then amongst those cruisers especially the ones with very high uh, content of TNT filler in their semi-armor piercing shells this is, they are just made to kill you especially the Chapayevs and the Kirovs are devastating and then also the DPM from uh, yeah from the Southampton and the premium counterpart the same goes here for the premium cruiser the Helena and also the Brooklyn for the Americans they just can spam you to death um, your armor doesn't really hold up to that spam um, the deck is also pretty funny at 13 millimeters and you can see that there are some gaps there is not nothing that protects your the bow section and also there are some serious gaps if you try to kite away from the enemy um, where there is no protection here from the lower belt to the actual deck and also the deck has here a step where there is no protection um, the turrets, the single gun turrets, are also only protected by 25 millimeters. That is Mogami style protection. On the other hand, uh, you can lose one or two turrets and it doesn't really cost you all that much firepower compared to some other cruisers where losing two turrets is then a major disadvantage. The bridge is protected by the three inch armor and uh, that means that you're not safe from losing your crew on the bridge and therefore losing control of the ship for a swift period of time but um, you are also kind of safe from low caliber HE shells. Removing the external arm armor, we can see that we have here a 38 uh, deck plating over the machinery. And then here, what is supposedly to be the protection for the magazines is only 13 millimeter. That's a joke. And the deck plating of that is 25 millimeters that's also never gonna hold up to anything but it can absorb a shrapnel here and there can reduce the incoming damage and as you can see the majority of those especially the front magazines is below the waterline so the closer you get to the enemy the less likely it is to receive an ammo rack detonation on the contrary here we have an ammo rack step ammo rack ladder and uh, whereas the most rear mounted gun is more or less safe that gun is right at the waterline and this one is right 
above the waterline. And if we go to the x-ray, we can see that the machinery is mostly nicely under the water line as well as the front magazines. But this magazine, where is, uh, which is just under the rear mast, where also the fixed torpedo tubes are, yes, fixed, and yes, only four to per side. Um, easy, easy to wreck this. Uh, the, the maximum protection is here, um, yeah, going to 76.2 millimeter with a little bit of plunging fire effect, 50.8, crashing down to the through the 13 millimeter deck. This is not serious protection, right? And uh, this represents World War I cruiser design. Um, and you have to fight something like a Hipper. You have to fight something like a Mogami, a Chapayev, Brooklyn, uh, Southampton. All those ships that spam you with uh, still very decent or outright brutal shells. This ship is not going to hold up to this kind of punishment. But sometimes it is also surprisingly durable um, when the enemy just can't shoot. But hey, then any cruiser is good, right? And now to pure statistics, to the pure facts as they are true in War Thunder. So now finally the statistics, the pure golden heart argument in War Thunder and admit it, you all have been waiting just for that. And when it comes to the HMS Hawkins in comparison to the 5.7 cruisers, it's an up and down in statistics. Overall nine ships in comparison here. So let's now bring order to the chaos. Let's begin with the firepower, the selling point of any given warship. Seven 190 millimeter guns for the Hawkins, which is an unusual caliber. And also we have for this battle rating, very unusual, a turret wing design. So the maximum broadside are six. 7.5 inch 45 BL Mark 6 guns. An overall amount of ammunition of 1050 rounds might be sufficient for up to the middle of the match, but then you come into problems. The reload is 10.0 seconds. While that is one second faster than the Kirov and you have uh, bigger caliber guns, the Kirov just simply has more guns, 50% more, nine compared to six per broadside. And so this is reflected in the effective DPM shells per minute. You only fire 36. The only ship is uh, that is worse is in fact the USS Pensacola with its ridiculous 20 second reload. While you come close to the Admiral Hipper, much like the Mogami, the Pensacola, the Kirov, you will fall off due to the fact that your turrets are not really protected mm -hmm. efficiently. So you have to fight not just only fires and flooding and have to repair your propulsion, you also have to repair the guns on a regular basis. And uh, while there are not that big targets, there are more of those turret targets for the enemy to shoot and hit and knock out. And also due to the arrangement of the turrets, you have to unangle your ship and give quite a substantial amount of broadside to bring all six guns to bear. With five guns, the angle is much sharper, but even if you angle very much in, then you can only use three guns and that halves your effective DPM um, to 18 rounds per minute. But at least this ship has torpedoes, right? Yeah, but those Mark V torpedoes are not really fast with 46 kilometers per hour. The range is okayish with 12.34 with the torpedo mod, but you have only four 533 millimeter torpedoes. And they are only two per side in fixed torpedo tubes, so you have to aim with the entirety of the ship. Um, so they are the worst torpedoes in this comparison. In fact, I have not managed to get a single kill with those torpedoes in all the matches that I played. The displacement fairly average. The top speed is another weakness. In fact, this is the slowest cruiser. It's not really extremely slow, but if you consider that all the other cruisers go at least 60 kilometers per hour, with the Kirov being able to um, get up to 67 kilometers per hour, you can see that yeah, you cannot make those quick maneuvers, you cannot really dodge forever, you will lose speed quite, uh, quite quickly, and yeah, your uh, propulsion is also not really that protected to not get knocked out as well. The crew amount is the third lowest with only 749 and also there is no real safe place so you also die in this cruiser which is rather unusual for a cruiser pretty quickly under shell fire even without an MREC due to the loss of crew.
Finally, let's talk about the ammunition and the ship has access to only two shell types for its 7.5 inch guns. The stock 7.5 inch high explosive shell travels at a maximum speed uh, uh, of the muscle velocity of 844 meters per second and as you can see when you look at the HE basic that is kind of average it's far from the Kirov, the Chapaev and the Admiral Hippas railguns and that makes it a bit more difficult to hit the target at range in contrast to those hard hitters of 5.7. Another thing is the TNT equivalent of 7.3 kilograms, which is reflected in the blast penetration of 57 millimeters. And this is where the joke begins. You are barely better than the HMS Tiger with its rapid firing six inch guns. Yes, you double the pitiful HMS Belfast 3.6 kilograms, but you're not really that far away from the Chapaev and the USS Brooklyn, which both have protected 6 inch turrets, 12 of them, with a substantial higher DPM. And so they can just spam the enemy to death with uh, shells um, carrying up to 6 kilograms of TNT. And also, <laughs> the other 8.0 inch cruisers like the Pensacola, Mogami and Admiral Hipper also have significantly higher TNT filler in the shells. But the real joke here is the Kirov because Russia. Um, you see that shell travels at 920 meters per second and carries a 12.2 kilogram heavy warhead, nearly doubling your pitiful 7.3 uh, kilogram TNT equivalent. So that just tells you that you lack not only the alpha, but also the DPM, and that is just something that is unbearable for a 5.7 cruiser. And maybe, maybe the AP is better. Let's have a look. So finally, as a tier 1 upgrade, you then unlock the 7.5 inch SAPC semi armor piercing ballistic cap shell. It again travels at a mass velocity of 844 meters per second, but it doesn't really... Uh, compete versus the other cruisers that well. First of all, the raw penetration of 285 millimeters is okayish comparable versus some of the six inch cruisers in fact. But then when you look at the penetration value at 10 kilometers, it falls off dramatically and uh, it then only has half the penetration value of most six inch gun cruisers. Now this is semi armor piercing and some of the other ships semi armor piercing shells are represented under the special shell at the very right. So ha let's have a look there. Um, so <laughs> first of all the Admiral Hipper at 10 kilometers has 261 millimeters so 199 millimeters more than you and uh, yeah it doesn't have really the same bursting charge but at least it punches through any sort of armor and just brings the damage home at least and then when you go to the very bottom right of the special shells you can see that the Kirov has 304 millimeters of penetration with a higher muscle velocity and a bursting charge that is nearly three times larger with nearly 11 kilograms of TNT filler. That explains together with the DPM advantage that the Kirov has, the, the sheer compression in terms of performance. And then there is also the Chapayev together with the Brooklyn, both having 12 guns compared to your six uh, gun broadside. They have a significantly higher DPM to begin with and they have protected turrets. In particular, the Chapayev not only has with the regular AP more penetration or equal amounts of penetration, but has then more than twice the penetration at 10 kilometers range. Its semi armor piercing also has then twice the penetration power at range, 10 kilometers that is in this comparison, than the Hawkins semi armor piercing shell. It also, with a smaller caliber, higher DPM and more guns, brings a significantly higher bursting charge of 5.9 kilograms compared to your pitiful 3.9 kilograms to the table, so 2 kilograms more. And that just explains together with the uh, distributed armor scheme why you will most likely lose any sort of duel versus the enemy at any sort of uh, given range. 
and at short range they just burst you to death and you have uh, less protected turrets so the story of pain is endless and there is not even an anti-aircraft shell to begin with for any sort of fancy shooting and also your secondaries don't have proximity fuse shells so now let's give this ship a final verdict let's just bring this ship into context and uh, this is where a little bit of the rant begins so now we have seen the facts the ship lack the dpm and the alpha strike with its guns it lacks the secondary firepower it lacks the really effective anti-aircraft firepower it lacks the speed it lacks the armor it lacks effective usable torpedoes and that is just not worthy of 5.7 but the pure fact that this is a ship um, built around World War I, having to fight off some post-World War II cruisers at the very same battle rating uh, with the current meta, um, with the long-range open water engagements, is just outright ridiculous. I have a theory because when I look into the tech tree, I see that this is now the beginning of rank 5 and this is the most left ship that there is. So the line will continue to the right and we will have a really effective increase in terms of firepower, armor, speed, etc. Like we have with the light cruisers where we begin within the, um, uh, with the British tech tree with the HMS Enterprise and HMS Dido and end with the uh, HMS Southampton which is substantially better. But even in contrast to some other nations uh, 5.7 ships, this is just a joke and the ship has no place to go. You cannot really put it at 5.3 because it will just bully a lot of the other 5.0 and 5.3 cruisers but it has no chance versus the hard hitters of 5.7 and even amongst the 5.7 ships as you saw it just doesn't have any sort of advantage. This just shows with the combination of the ship's overall performance what it has to fight and also the map design as well as the hard stock grind etc and the ongoing power creep, feature creep and compression that it is clear for me that Gaichin really goes a hard unnecessary stupid way in development where ships like these are just a beginner they just extend the grind and they are just gun food for the top dogs and i think that this is a real shame because this ship can do more this ship um, would be like a bigger empton right and the empton also has its uh, place or had its place rather so this is just showing off how poor Gaijin's development department uh, acts in terms of um, yeah, the features given to the ship, the thought of balance and uh, I don't know. Right now the ship makes no sense. In the future this will just um, a stone in your way on your long way to the top, let's put it that way. And I think that this is really 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 poor design and i cannot tell you how how sad i am for this ship but also for the british that this is their fi first rank five cruiser it makes no sense why the likes of mogami the admiral hipper the chapayev uh, the kirov uh, the brooklyn and also the premium cruisers are rank four with significantly better performance in uh, any given aspect anti-aircraft speed armor firepower they are just better in that aspect and also in the torpedo department this ship has nothing going for it it's an absolute joke and frankly it just makes no sense to grind for it yes you can grind it you can unlock it but i would recommend you to not buy it um, and, and to put it into service it's nothing but gun food um, i could see this as a 5.3 ship and yes that would um, it that would make it really unfair versus some of the other 5.3s but then it would be in a better time frame but it makes absolutely no sense. It is ridiculous. I tried to just uh, try to figure out what it is you're really good at, but there is no there is no use to sugarcoat it. This is just simply a bad ship. Not because the ship is bad, but because it just lacks the performance compared to ships that it shares the battle rating that were developed and built thirty years later. 
imagine this in tanks oh wait we have that problems as well so yeah there you go if you thought compression is only a thing with tanks and planes want to know more you can enjoy the same with ships as well and that is my review on the HMS Hawkins I hope that you guys enjoyed it um, I'm sorry but I couldn't really make it work it's not my fault it's not your fault it's not the ship's fault it's all Gaijin's fault and with that I close the review so thanks for watching thanks for listening I hope you enjoyed the review nevertheless please give it a like with it subscribe if you want to see more share this with your friends and clanmates and also let me know in the comment section what you think about uh, this ship uh, top tier naval forces uh, where the journey will end and as usual we will see each other on the battlefields in the skies and on the waves of war thunder mm -hmm.